All right, well, let's get started here. Um, so this is our second discussion section. And last time we um, spent a lot of time looking in the XV6 kernel. And uh, today everything will be in user space. And there's uh, two parts today. Uh, first, we're going to be looking at six different system calls that are related to processes um, that I've listed here. We'll go through these. And then second, people have been asking me a lot of uh, questions just about um, C basics in general. And so um, in order to try to get everybody up to speed and on the same page, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the more confusing features of C. So <laughs> if, if you guys are like, already experts in C, you could, uh, if you want, just leave here as soon as we're done with part one. But otherwise, at the end of the day, I'm going to be talking about type defs, function pointers, um, how to use static and extern, and then includes and if defs. So I had emailed uh, everybody and asked if they had anything in particular they wanted me to cover. And unfortunately, everything people ask me about, I don't really know anything about. Um, so one of the things that uh, people had asked for was kind of like a tutorial on C tags. Uh, C tags just lets you create indexes on your code so you can quickly search for identifiers. I usually just use grep, but um, it seems like a lot of people use this, so maybe I'll learn it myself just so I can um, share it with you guys as another tool this semester. And also, um, a few people have been asking about testing frameworks. So usually what I do myself is I'll just write, say, a Python program that exercises my code in a variety of ways. And I don't use any framework. Uh, the only framework I've used that I really thought was um, had some awesome features above just like running things myself in Python was uh, at Google when I did an internship there. But unfortunately, that's closed source. So I can't talk about that. But maybe at some point um, during the semester, I'll learn, uh, look at some different testing frameworks and share some of those with you. So. Does anybody have any questions uh, from the project before I talk about the new stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so, are your grades going to be based off of how they pass all the tests? So, uh, this time, yes, it will be. Um, in the future, we're going to release most of the tests, but hold, hold back some of them. Just so that, like, what we don't want to do is, like, I've been talking to some of the TAs who some of them have actually taken 537 in the past. And what they've seen is that if we just release all the tests, people will just sit down and figure out how to write past the first test and pass the second, and they don't actually think of the bigger picture. So in the future, we'll release um, most of the tests and then hold just like a few back. So you can have to like think just a little bit beyond just what the tests are. Um, so there's another case where you could, even if we didn't release the test, you could pass all of them and still not get a good grade. And that would happen if you, say, use a library that you aren't supposed to use. So for example, one of the upcoming projects will be for you to create a malloc. And if your implementation of malloc is just a wrapper around the malloc you already have, obviously you aren't going to get very much credit on that, even if you pass all the tests, which you would. Um, but, it, but in general, yeah, like your, the percentage of tests, or the tests that you pass will uh, pretty much determine your grade. Any other questions? All right, so um, let's dive in here. And yeah, feel free to ask questions as I go. Um, so a lot of people are going to be watching this on a video later, so it's your responsibility to, even if you know the answer, you can um, ask a question just for other people who might be confused. So this is also a good cover if uh, it's a question you're embarrassed to ask yourself. So um, let's dive in here, and the first thing we're going to look at is this exec VP call, and I'm going to pull up the man pages on that. And you can just, uh, I want to get you all in the habit of just reading these man pages whenever you want to learn something. And you see that there's a collection of different exec calls here. Um, and pretty much what they're all doing, so you see it's the exec, fa exec family, and they all replace the current process image with a new process image. So how do people interpret that? What does that mean? A new process. Well, actually, it won't be a new process, um, just a new process image. So um, any other thoughts on what, what that pra pragmatically looks like? What's that? Yeah, it replaces the address space. So pretty much, um, you know, in your address space, you have a bunch of code, you have your heap, your stack. All of that goes away, and then you get those things for a new program. So basically, you have the same process, but first it was executing one program, and now it basically morphs into being a different program. So, so this is one of the weirder, weirder system calls you'll encounter. Um, and also a fork is also going to be pretty strange today. So I'm just going to walk through these slowly and uh, show you how these work. 
So when I scroll down, I look at the return values for um, this function, and I say that um, if it re actually does return, an error has occurred. And so the normal case is that I just run this thing, and then um, it never comes back, and it's just another program is executing. So let's, uh, I'm going to copy some stuff right out of the man page. So first I see I have to grab this, uh, this header file if I want to use this program. I'm going to add that here. And then let me go back and grab the, the actual call. So you see this, this is what it is right here. I'm going to copy this. And you can, you can read through this on your own, but basically what it's doing is that this file argument, that is uh, the name of, a new, of the new program to run. And then uh, argv, well, that's what the new program is going to see for its argv and its main function. So let me copy this and come back here. And I'm going to do this right in between these two hello messages. And basically the, what we're going to build with this is we're going to build a little wrapper around um, ls. So let me just save this and come back. So normally when I type ls, I don't really like this because it doesn't give me much information. Um, so usually what I would do instead is I would say la, and that shows me um, all the files, including hidden files, and then it shows me their sizes and things like that. So I'm going to make a new program that I don't have to pass any arguments to, and it basically produces um, this output right here. So let me go back to um, our code here. And so the first thing we have to do is we have to set up um, our new uh, argv for our new program. So that's going to be argv2. And then we have to have it be size 3. And let me see here. So normally when you have argv, like the first thing in that array is the actual name of the program. So I'm going to say ls. The second thing is uh, la. That's the argument we wanted to pass. And then if you read the man pages, uh, we have to, um, you notice, notice that when I call this exec vp, there's no argument count. So the way it tells the, the, the size of the array is it just loops over it until it finds an item that's null. So, oh, so basically I'm going to just say that that third item is null, and then I can pass in this. And then uh, the name of the program I'm executing is just uh, the first argument. <coughs> So I'm going to run this, <coughs> and uh, let me compile. Uh, oops, I need to. So what, is, what does constant do? Do people Are people familiar with this? Can somebody just say what it is? Right, yeah, so this is just kind of a safeguard that you can't change it. But we actually do have to change this. So I'm just trying to eliminate that there, and then run this. I run a dot out, and uh, there we go. So it says hello one, and then at that point it, it switches over to the ls program and it prints out all these things, and you see it never came back, right? So if it had come back, we would have uh, seen hello two at the end, but it didn't do that. Um, so that's the exec vp call. Uh, does anybody have any questions on, on how that works? Yeah. Why didn't it come back? So basically, um, the program that I was running, it just like completely stops running it and runs the other one. So it's not even just a function call, it's, it's like basically I'm morphing into a completely different program. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to switch to another system call now, which is uh, might seem unrelated at first, and then I'm going to come back and pull them together. So the next, next function call I want to look at is, well actually, let me I give a little bit more background before we do that. Um, I'm going to open a file here. And uh, you can read in the man pages what you need um, for the flags. But I basically want to create a new file. That's uh, I'm creating it, and it's write-only. And if it already exists, I want to truncate it. And I'm just going to set up some uh, file permissions. And this is kind of ugly, but you can, you can read up on that if you want. And I just want to see what this file descriptor, what the value of this is. Oh, 
And then I see that I forgot something. So if I, if I wanted to, I could run man open now. And I see I have to include this uh, fcontrol.h if I want to use open. So let me just go back quick. OK, so that compiles fine. And now I'm just going to run this. And we see file descriptor 3. Um, does anybody have any, does anybody know why it starts at file descriptor 3? You don't want to apply in the open error. What's that? You don't want to assign for the input of the error. Yeah, exactly. So in, in, in Linux file descriptors, they can either go to files or they can go to output. And uh, 0 is for input. Um, and then 1 and 2 are for normal output and then errors. So that's the reason uh, why it starts at 3. So let me, let me show you here what would happen um, if, so I end up printing, let me comment some stuff out here. So I end up printing hello1 to start with, but I'm going to actually close uh, standard um, out, which is just one here. And now we see that this program actually outputs nothing, right? Because normally uh, printf is just a wrapper. It's writing this uh, file descriptor 1, and now it's not there anymore. And you can actually see this um, uh, if, if we grepped for standard out under our include files. Uh, we could see that there's uh, that standard out, the file number is just one. And similarly, if we uh, looked under here. And whenever the documentation isn't good, you should really be in the habit of looking at what the actual uh, header files are under user include. Um, and so forth. So there's zero. So let me go back here quick. <coughs> so we're going to do a little experiment now. So we've closed one. And now I'm going to open up this new file and print something out. So what, what, what is this program going to do here? Yeah, it'll print to a file. So Whenever uh, you get a file descriptor, Linux kind of by default it just grabs the first one that's available. And in this case, um, since we just uh, closed one, uh, one is going to be available. So let me run this here. And again, there's no output. But now we see that we have this out.txt file. So we were basically able to redirect what normally went to um, the terminal. We can just redirect that to a file now. And uh, so this is just a nice... Um, setup, right? Because you can plug these programs together and use them in different ways. Sometimes you just want to see the output, sometimes you want to save it to a file. So let me show you um, another way we could do this now. Uh, so, so that's kind of lucky, right? Because maybe it would have chosen another one if, uh, if there was another one available. So if we actually want to force it, uh, our um, output stream, to go to this, this open, we can use this little call called dupe. And this is maybe... Um, uh, useful on the next project, which we'll be releasing soon. So let me just pull this up. And this basically uh, duplicates um, a descriptor object uh, from one file descriptor to another. So now you basically have two file descriptors that are referring to the same source or sync of data. So let me jump back here quick. And what I can do then is, so I've opened this one, and I'm going to just do dupe, and I'm going to say from uh, file descriptor to one. Let me see if this works. And so you see I don't have to close standard one now. Actually, I'm going to move uh, out just so that we're sure it's working. And there it works again. So uh, basically this was closing uh, file descriptor one automatically, and then it's saying whatever file descriptor uh, just FD is, that should be the same thing as one. Um, so now what we can do is we can really combine these things. So I do the exec down here. So even I told you that we're basically morphing into another process and that the code is changing and the memory is changing, all these things. Um, one thing that does not change is all the file descriptors you have. So what this means that we could do is we could uh, close file descriptor 1 and set it up to be something else and then exec something. And that would just go uh, to the file we set it up as. So let me... Uh, pull this code back here. So now we have both our dupe2 and our exec vp. And let me run this. And now we see that in this out file, um, we, have, uh, we have basically the, stand, the, uh, the output of ls. And it's actually interesting. If I run ls again, 
uh, you see that the out file actually has some size. So basically it was running the program before anything was written to this file and it was written out. So any questions so far about execvp or dupe2? Yeah. Yeah, so this Hello World 2, that does not end up in there, right? Because this is, this is code that was in the first program, and then we just never execute that program after execvp. Um, the only case you would execute that is if this execvp um, somehow failed, which it could be a little fickle. If you don't get it right, it could return for that. So that's, that's the way you would check the error codes on this, is if, it's, if code is running after you call it, you know something bad happened. So any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to look at um, another kind of weird system call, uh, which is the fork call. And I'm going to delete a lot of this code here. Actually, let me save a backup. Is we might borrow some of it again. But I'm going to delete a lot of this code. And I'm going to call fork. And what a fork does is it basically takes a process and then it makes another process that's identical to it. Okay, so um, what might this? What would this program print out? You just shout it out. Yeah, exactly. So let me just run this. Uh, yeah, and we see that uh, kind of before the fork, there was just one program running, and then after we have two programs running. And let me show you a little bit more how this works. So it, we can get a return value for this. And uh, basically before, I want to say what my PID is. So I'm going to call git PID. I think we've talked about this before, but basically every program in Linux has a name, and that name is just a number. It's process ID. And we can get that with this system call. And uh, then I'm also going to print this after. So this is my hello too. And uh, I also want to print what the return value is. Okay. And can everybody see that at the bottom there? Um, can anybody not see it? Okay, good. Um, so what we see then is that we just have one hello one again, and we see that the process ID that's running is this 46910. And then afterwards, we see that there's two different process IDs. And uh, I mean, this makes sense that the <laughs> child process is just one more than the parent process, because it's just like choosing consecutive numbers internally. And the other difference we see between uh, the parent and child is that the parent has uh, the process ID of the child as a return value, and then the child um, sadly does not know who its parent is. Um, so does that make sense so far? So this is just handy, right? Because we can, uh, we can do fork, and then we, if we can know whether or not we're the child or the parent, we can have them do different pieces of work and uh, kind of say run some things concurrently if we wanted to. So let me go back here and uh, so one of the things here is that you see that the parent is always running first, but that's kind of just a coincidence of the scheduling. If say the parent had to um, run a long time, so I'm going to just say uh, so if, if RV is greater than zero um, this is the parent code So we could just put the parent to sleep for a while and uh, then print something. Sorry, I'm having trouble typing here. I switched over to the Dvorak keyboard lately, recently. So then in this case, we're the child. And then I, 
guess the other thing I could do is I could assert that uh, in every case, the return value should be uh, greater than or equal to zero for both the child and the parent. Oops. Oh, and I missed an include file there. Have people used, uh, do people know what assert is? Okay. So has, who, who has not used assert before? There's a few people. So basically what assert does is, is as you're running your program, maybe there's, you have some assumptions about uh, the state of the program, and it would be too messy to deal um, with the cases those don't. So you could just say assert this, and then if that doesn't happen, um, the program would just die. And, and it's a little strange, but like a lot of people, um, they might use this for debugging, and then when they actually ship, uh, they'll just take out all their uh, asserts like automatically um, so that you can run a little bit faster. But this is a helpful tool to make sure, um, like I can just do this a little quicker instead of having to turn off an error message or something. So I'm going to run this now and run that out again. And, oops, what is it doing here? Oh, I just have an extra character there. All right, and then I can see that in this case, the child ends up running first before the parent. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to coordinate between the child and parent. So maybe say like we want the child to run first. So then what we can do is if I come back here, um, here's another system call that you can um, uh, uh, remember. Um, we can wait for our child. And I'm just going to pass null here. If you look at the man pages for wait, you can actually say uh, get a return code back from the child to say, no, if your child uh, died or was successful or whatever. And uh, in this case now, um, the child is always going to run first no matter what. And I, it, that doesn't really prove anything, right, because maybe the scheduler is just doing that. But if I, if I put the child to sleep, then, then you can see that the parent is still waiting. You see that? So um, it waits until the child runs and then uh, the parent runs and then it's done. So any, any questions uh, so far about any of the system calls we've looked at? Yeah? So what's going on behind the scenes for the board? Um, like, mm -hmm. prior year suggested that probably just duplicates the process and runs from 6 to 5. Is that what's actually happening? Right, so um, we'll be looking at it in detail for one of the assignments because you're going to have to like, uh, write a function that's very similar for a fork. Uh, but basically it's, it's allocating a new process and then it's copying all the memory over, but it's not copying all the file descriptors. The file descriptors are still pointing to the same, same objects. So um, and it's, it's, uh, we'll certainly be looking at it in more detail, but even if you wanted to, you could just like uh, browse around in the XV6 code and you could find that. And uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not, not doing anything insane. So, yeah. So basically, it's kind of weird because like it's like one one process called fork, and then like two processes returned from fork, right? So they both they both thought they were the one that called it, right? This is like one of the weirder system calls. Does that make sense? <coughs> no. Okay. Um, how, how can the children got in the value of are we like <laughs> like zero? Haha. Uh -huh. So. So basically, like think back in class, right, where we had like the list of all these. Uh, like remember the process struct in XV6, right? So when we call into fork, we just created a new process struct, and that process struct had a lot of things in it. It had like a list of open files. Um, it had uh, it had like a stack in it and all these things. So we made another one of these, and then uh, since we have two two of these, we can return from a system call back into either of these processes. We, we like we have two two processes that are basically the same. And we can start running either of them whenever we want. And since we're the operating system, uh, when we start running them, we can jump to any place in the code we want of the process, right? So we're jumping into the place in the code that looks like we just returned from fork. So does that make sense? Any other questions? I guess we can look at code at some point and then, uh, or, or come bug me after class and we can talk more about it and maybe I'll walk you through some code today. Um, Okay, so let me show you another thing here. Uh, let's say we have this variable x. 
So this is just trying to emphasize again that the child and parent have different memory. Um, so let's just uh, set this to zero to start with. And um, uh, the, the, the parent is waiting for the child. And afterwards, we're going to print off uh, what x equals. And uh, before the child finishes running, uh, the child is going to set x to something else. OK? So what, what do people expect that the parent will print out here? What? Zero. It'll print out zero, uh, right? Because uh, even though like, both the parent and the child have, uh, have like, uh, similar variables, like they're different instances of the same process or the same program. So they're going to have, uh, be different. So if I run this, I can run out. And then we see that, yeah, x is 0. I'll move after uh, yeah, that. I have a question. Yeah. What if uh, the child process works on other processes? The parent waits for a reason that? So, um, so I'm pretty sure what would happen is that then if that child did a wait, um, <coughs> then kind of like the child would be waiting for the grandchild. Um, uh, so basically, like, you could almost think of like all the processes that are in the tree. So when you first boot up the operating system, there's just uh, one init process. And this is another thing we can look at in XV6. And that one's going to start a shell process where you like type in commands and stuff. And then that shell process creates all the other processes. So each time when one of them calls for wait, it's just waiting for one of its immediate children. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is actually. If you look in the XV6 code, there's a field um, that is just a pointer to a process struct, and it's called parent. So, yeah, that's exactly that's how they implement it, just the way you're thinking. Other questions? Yeah. So there's a way that when you're in like, the child process to get like, data out still from the parent by using like, where the parent's memory is located in memory, like it's changed very well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, that's the, that's the next thing I'm going to show. So um, are there more questions before I uh, show that? All right, so yeah. So basically, um, if we want these two processes commu to communicate, we can use um, the last system call I'm going to teach you today, which is pipe. And what pipe does is it creates two file descriptors. And one of them you can write to, and the other one you can read from. And if we do this before we call, uh, we call fork, well, then you know that um, both children processes, remember they share, they share file descriptors but not memory. Well, one, the child can say write to uh, the pipe, and then the parent can read from the pipe. So let me show you, well, let me bring up the man page so you can uh, look at this. Oh, that's the wrong pipe. So, so here's just another thing. If, like, sometimes like, there's different calls in Linux that mean the same thing. So um, if I have to put a number before it, then I can specify which one I mean. So basically all system calls are two. So I would say man, two, and then the thing I want. Um, kind of like the man three pages are usually kind of like C libraries, and the one pages are things you like, uh, kind of like Linux commands. So generally, if you go to the wrong thing and it doesn't make sense, just like do man two if you want to get the system call. So we see that man two is taking, uh, is taking an array of two file descriptors. And uh, the first file descriptor connects to the read end of the pipe, and the second connects to the write end. Uh, so we can just set this up here. And we want two of these guys. And uh, we should call this before we actually fork. So I'm going to say pipe uh, FDs. And let me check the return value on this. Uh, so the return value should be uh, not negative if it's correct. And then what we can do here is, so we have the x variable. Well, actually, I'm going to get rid of x now to make this example a little bit more clear. Um, so here's the parent, and we have a parent which has a receive variable, and the child is going to have a send variable. And the child wants to send one, two, three. And then the parent is going to try to um, get what is being sent and put that in the receive variable. <laughs> so let me just... Uh, uh, see what the parent receives here, uh, RECV. And so the way the child can write this is we have to write this, uh, this variable to file descriptor 1. Uh, 
Okay, and the thing we want to do, we have to, like when we have the right call, we have to pass a pointer to memory. So that's why I'm going to get the address of send. And then how do we know how much data to send? Well, that's just the size. Uh, that's just the size of send. Okay, and I should probably be checking uh, return values on here and stuff, but I'm not going to do that um, for now. And then when I'm up here, I can do a very similar call, and I'm going to be reading from file descriptor zero, and I want to read that into. Uh, I'm just going to read it to the bytes where the receive variable at is at, and then I I know what size it is. Okay. So this should be sending one, two, three, and then the parent should see that. And we see great. So if the child is able to send one, two, three, and then the parent receives it. So um, this is another thing that's going to be useful um, on the next project. You're going to be doing these pipes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, we could because uh, in this case, when we try to read something, um, read is going to wait until that data is actually there to read. Uh, so basically we'll wait anyway. So this should work fine as well. Yeah, good point. All other questions? So um, in the next project, which is going to be coming out soon, you're basically going to be uh, writing a shell. So uh, for instance, like bash is a shell, which I'm running, and I can run instances of bash within bash. And one of the common features of shells are, uh, there's two features, one is called a redirect and one is a pipe. So let me just run the echo program here. The echo program just prints something, and if I want to, I can put this little arrow here and say uh, out.text. And what the shell does then is it basically does that dupe thing we were talking about and it puts that um, to this out.text file. So if I run that, and I can chat out that text. Um, so that, that was using the dupe to system call that we were talking about. And then another example is I can, let me run echo again. I can run this pipe command. And what the pipe command does is it forks off two processes and it sets up a pipe between them so that the standard out of one is feeding into the standard end of the other. So I could feed this to a program, say like word count, and it could tell me that um, hello is six characters long. So uh, in the next assignment, uh, you're going to be implementing both these features, both pipes and redirects. So um, any questions on any of that so far? Okay, so those are the six uh, new system calls um, to learn. And now I'm going to uh, transition over to just reviewing some of the more confusing features of C. Um, so if, if you're like already an expert in C, like feel free to step out. Like I won't feel bad. Um, but otherwise, we're going to be covering uh, a few features. Let me, oh, sorry. So we're going to be covering type defs, function pointers, static, extert, and includes, and if defs. Um, so I'm going to get rid of all this code. And again, I'm just going to be asking like a lot of uh, questions to see if you can predict what will happen when we either compile um, or run a program. So here's my S. And let's say I tried to uh, make an instance of this and then on the stack. And then I tried to say, oh, <laughs> let me just name this something better. So I'm going to call this my struct. What would happen if I try to run this? It won't compile, right? So let's just try running that. Um, and we see that it's confused, right? There is no symbol called uh, my struct. Uh, oops. And so what we one way to fix this is we could just say struct here like that. And because that's the name of this thing, it's, it's struct my struct. And then this would work. Uh, but that gets pretty cumbersome after a while. So what people do is they can rename, or not rename, but create a new name for something. So we, we could say type def. This is just a way to rename something. And we could uh, rename it also as my struct. And then I can actually get rid of this. And 
Uh, why is that unhappy? Oh, just a typo. Okay, and that works fine. Um, so, like, this really could be named anything. So, like, maybe it's something you might commonly see is maybe this might have a couple um, underscores in front of it just to make the code a little bit more readable, and that still compiles. And then another thing that you might often see is that we could uh, combine the definition of struct here uh, with the type def. And what that would look like is I would say type def, and then the thing I have, and then I could just say uh, my struct like that. So this is code that you're often going to see, and it's a little bit ugly, but like once we get used to it, um, it becomes pretty familiar. And that compiles fine. Um, so another thing that's kind of weird is uh, function pointers and also type defs of function pointers. So let me create a program here um, uh, that uses some function pointers. Well, first here, let, let me have some functions that I can point to. Uh, uh, function one. <coughs> And they're just going to return different things. And then this test function, what that's going to do is that's going to take um, a pointer to, well, here, let me show you how I build a, build a function pointer. So I could start with something like this, so kind of like a function definition. And then I just put parentheses around the name and then um, a star there. So this is my function pointer. And I can pass that to test, just like so. And then if I wanted to, I could just print off what that is. And then I can, I can call it just a function pointer, just like I would call a normal function. So let me, let me run this here. First, I'm going to call it function, uh, function 1, and then I'll call it with function 2. All right, and there, there it goes. Does the syntax make sense, kind of? So um, one sy syntax that's kind of weird is that uh, we can type def this, because this is pretty ugly to use everywhere. Um, and to type def it, a type def just looks very much like uh, uh, the function pointer itself. And it would look like uh, something like this. And then what I could do is I could just, that's my type now, and then I could just have function again. OK? And then it still works the same way. So you're going to encounter like a lot of weird looking things like this. And it's just uh, it's helpful if you can kind of remember what, what they do. I feel like a lot of libraries, I, I put it more on you to find out what they are. Because like libraries are easy to Google for. Um, but often when you see weird syntax, it's, it's hard to know like how I could Google something to say, like, what does this thing mean? Um, so the next thing we can look at are um, intern and uh, or static and intern uh, modifiers. So a lot of people have been asking questions about this on, uh, on our mailing lists. So let me just run through an example here. So these, these really make sense using these when you have multiple files. So I'm going to create uh, another file here. And let me see. So I'm going to call it test, which is going to be in a helper file. Okay, so let me pull up both of these at the same time. Will this compile if I try to run both of these at the same time? So basically what I have to do then is I'd have to have that and helper.c. Well, what would I expect here? Oh, what is that? That's... I know what the first error is about, so let me go back to helper here. Or no, so one thing I need to do is that in my helper, 
function, like it doesn't know where this is. So basically, I need to give it a hint, just like a prototype, to say that this is a function that's going to be defined later. And that helps uh, the, the compiler link all these things together. So that, that's my first error. And then what is this guy here? <laughs> Oh, I see. Uh, good call. Um, okay, so uh, that works fine so far. Um, uh, let me actually put a value here. So, but now, like the problem we could run into is that if main also has uh, has an x and that equals something, well, what would happen if I try to compile this program? Any guesses? Well, I'll just I'll just try it and see what happens. So I'm ready, I'm ready to compile both main and helper, and I get an error. It says that there's a duplicate symbol um, here because I'm basically I have the same variable name in both files, and I'm trying to compile compile these two together. So. Um, let me see how I can fix that. So I can fix that by making this not global, but I can make it private now. And I do that with the static keyword. And I'm going to do that in both of these. Okay. Oops. What does it like here? Uh, on use variable x. Oh, it's just it's, it's, this is just a warning. It's just complaining it doesn't like that. So I'll just I'll just use that quick. Okay, so um, now we see when we have static in both of these, um, this should compile fine and run. And and what is it trying to print out when I run this? You can just shout it out if you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, it prints uh, three from main and then five from the other one. <coughs> so sometimes this is what you want, but let's say there might be other times when you actually want to uh, share the variable between these two. So in that case, what we need to do is we need to go back to helper.c and we could uh, make one of these global again and then we could make the other one, we could make this one extern and that just says that we want to use x in this function but not in the other one. So um, what do people think? Is this one going to compile? Just like as it is right now? What's that? It should or shouldn't? Who thinks it will compile? Who thinks it won't compile? Who, ha who doesn't have an opinion? That's not everybody, but okay. Uh, so I'm going to try to compile this. And again, it's, it's not happy. And it says that this extern variable has an initializer. If, if I have an extern variable, that means I'm saying this thing is declared somewhere else. And it's not my right to initialize somebody else's variable, right? Like there's going to be a conflict there. So I need to go back to main.c. And if I just have it just like this, then this should work fine. Let me, let me add a new line here while I'm at that. All right, and now, now they should have the same uh, value. Okay, and they're both five, and that's all good. <laughs> so let me see if there's what else I want to talk about for this. Okay, so any, any questions so far about um, uh, static and extern? I'm going to go into some header files next. Yeah. In the first case, x equals zero, mm -hmm. even though in the other file it was five. Oh. Uh, was that, that here? Was I think it was initialized to zero in one case. Was that where they were both static? Oh, was it at first zero? Um, I think so, or maybe I didn't initialize it, and maybe it just uh, oh, okay. was lucky I got zero. I should have initialized it in both cases, so maybe I just gave a bad example. But if if if, if it was both static, I could have initialized it to zero and one and five and other. Other questions? 
OK, so now let's uh, look at some header file things. So here's like a common mistake that, that people make. Um, they might want to define this header file, and their idea might be to, um, to put the variable in here. OK? And then, uh, because, right, then both of these files are going to share this. Do people, uh, do people know what the difference is between these brackets around include and the quotes? Can somebody just uh, refresh, refresh people's memory quick and say what that is? What's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So like I have all these uh, files here. If I put quotes around it, it just starts looking here. Otherwise, there's a couple other places, say like user include, where there's a lot of files. And so if I have the brackets, it looks, let's say, in user include in other places. If I have quotes, it looks in my current one. So let me jump back here quick. Um, so I'm including common. H, and I'm going to include that from my main file and also from my helper and get rid of this here. Um, okay, so uh, the only place x is now defined is in common.h. I don't have it defined in, in main and uh, I don't have it defined in helper. Okay, so what's going to happen when I try to compile this? Just feel free to shout it out if you know. What's that? It, it won't be undeclared because they're both going to be uh, including it. Yeah, exactly. Well, it won't look quite like that, but that's basically the gist of it. So let me just uh, try to run this. And this is the error we got the very first time where it said um, it's a duplicate symbol. And uh, it's just good to remember how these header files work. It's very simple. It's just basically um, when you include something, it's just like a copy paste. And I showed this once before, but if I say uh, GCC EP, I can run all my includes and see what I end up with. So if I do this on main.c, um, I see basically that the result is that, well, first it's dumping all these things from my other header files, but it has the global x in main.c, and then also it has it in helper.c. Um, so this is just like the very first uh, broken example we started with. So yeah, you're exactly right. Um, so, but there are cases where we would want to use header files um, to try to like, share between these. So let me show you an example here now. Um, what we have to do is, is when we actually, def yeah. Um, let's try it. <laughs> um, right. So do people, so I'll just show you the pattern that he's talking about. Uh, so you'll often see code that looks like this in C. Actually, I don't want to do this yet. I want to, I want to go through another example, but I'll come back to your suggestion. Um, so like the way, way you would do this is it's, it's appropriate to, in any place, have the X term uh, variable, and just, that just say it somewhere else. So what you'll often see uh, is something looks like this, and of course we can't include that, and then uh, just one of the files um, will have it declared. And then uh, this has to be global, right? So I don't have any modifiers on it. I don't say static or extern here. And then once again, the helper doesn't have anything, right? So in common, which everybody uses, it's extern, and just in, just in the main, and then I have the X. All right. Uh, so let me run this again now, and I can compile that. And great, it works. It works fine again. Um, actually, I need to. I should initialize it to something. Just just to show that it's the same. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to kind of like give another example that's going to segue into uh, what he was suggesting, and then we'll get back to his question. Um, so sometimes when you have these header files, header files can include other header files.
So I'm just going to include common, uh, common uh, 2.h here. And then I'm going to create that file. And I, I don't, OK, so I don't need anything here. And I don't know, I'll just like put a define here uh, or something. All right, so basically, uh, these guys include, um, the C files include common. The common file includes uh, common.h, and common.h includes common.h2. OK, and that compiles fine. And uh, let me run this again and show you how that works. Actually, this is a bad example because when I when I um, am doing like this, define kind of disappears. So instead, I'm just going to put a, a structure here so you can see what I mean. So I'm just going to call this struct test. Maybe I have to put something in there. I don't know. Um, right. So now, now you can see that if I include common and then common includes common 2.h, I actually end up with the structure um, in, in my main.c code. Okay, so here's a common situation you run, up, run into when you're uh, doing C. Maybe you have some structures in one place and some structures in the other, and you want them to refer to each other, right? Maybe um, you have like a tree, and a tree needs to refer to its child, which is in one file, and then maybe like the child needs to point back to the parent in the tree. So to show you what this looks like is Sometimes I might need to do something like this. So, uh, so right now, common two includes uh, common dot h, and then common dot h includes common two. So, what is C going to do when I try to compile this? Any guesses? Bad? Yeah, thumbs down. Uh, <laughs> good guess. Uh, so I'm going to run this quick. And we basically see that um, we caused an infinite recursion, not in our program, but in the compiler itself. Um, and this is very unhappy, right? So uh, this is unfortunate, right? Because we want header files to refer to each other, um, but we don't want to have infinite recursion. So a common pattern you'll see in C looks just like this. This is what he was talking about. What's your name again? What? A seed? Yeah, so this is what a seed was talking about before. Um, you'll say something uh, just like this, and then there's different variants of this. Um, but you'll say if common h is not defined, then we're going to define that thing. And then I have an uh, 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 end if at the end. And basically what that's saying is that um, what this is going to do is it's going to like break my loop, right? Because as soon, so first I define this thing and then I include common 2.h and then common 2.h uh, includes common .h again, but now this thing is already defined and this if def says like stop the recursion. So if I, if I compile this again now, oh, what, what is it unhappy about here now? Uh, common 2.h. Just for out of semicolon. Yeah, and then now it's happy. That breaks the breaks the recursion, and the two files can uh, reference each other. Um, so, uh, like, can you rephrase your question earlier? You were wondering what would happen if we put a global variable and an include, and then had this if def around it. Was that the question? So I'm going to go back to here, and I don't think it's going to work, but I guess we'll find out. Um, so I'm just going to put that like that. So now this is a global. And let me double check um, what we have here. So this is, I need to get rid of that. And then helper.c, uh, that has that. Let's see what happens now. Oh, and that seems to work actually. Um, Oh, why did that make a difference? It probably, so like, uh, I, I'm not sure why it didn't break the first time, uh, but basically like what could happen here is even though I say like don't define it twice, uh, C could compile the first, or the compiler could compile the first file by itself, 
and then you get a copy of x there. And then it's trying to compile just the second file by itself. And then now the, the if, um, like that hasn't been defined again. So you're gonna get two separate, like kind of like intermediate files that both have a thing, and then when it tries to put them together, then it's trying to break. Um, so yeah, in general, you can't do that. So you should um, have all your variables, uh, like the global variables where they actually live, those should be defined in the C files. And then um, if you want to reference them from outwhere, elsewhere, say from a header file or other code, then that should be an X turn. Um, so we're almost done here. I just want to show uh, one more minor thing with defines. Are there any questions? Um, yeah. Once you're done with uh, the plan, then can you show us how to debug like using CDB? Yeah, sure, for sure. Um, so let me just show in main.c here. So one other thing with defines. Uh, so I'll say a, uh, and then this is another thing that trips people up. Uh, a times two equals percent d, and then I'm going to say a. What is what is this trying to print out? What's that? <coughs> Is it, who, who, said, who, who says it'll print out um, 16? Well, a couple people. And who says it'll print out uh, 11? Another handful of people. So the second answer is right. Let me just run this quick. Uh, oh, I don't have, uh, I should have my new line there at the end. Right, and it's 11, so that's pretty puzzling. But if you actually, uh, if you do, uh, people are nodding, I think they're seeing what it is. Basically what, what you see that it, it does, if, if we don't put parentheses around the five at plus three, then it's gonna multiply two by the three and then just add five. So the way to fix this um, would be to put it like this, and then it's gonna do the 16. So this is just, these are just uh, common bugs that people run into. And there you go. Um, so how are we doing in time? I think we have until 3.45, right? So I can show you, um, I haven't prepared anything here, but I can run through some quick examples um, in GCC if you like. Um, or, or in GDB, I'm sorry. Uh, so kind of like uh, the most useful thing I think is doing is just like when you have a seg fault, knowing what line, um, line it's on. So, uh, our pointer. I'm just going to print out a message here. And then if I did something, if I did something like this, this would, this would break, right? Because I'm going to be dereferencing an all pointer. So uh, I run that guy and oops, that doesn't break. Uh, that's unfortunate. I guess I just, that's printf is too smart. Um, so I'm going to change this slightly and say have an integer pointer here, and I'm going to actually make it dereference it. Um, I can't write a program that crashes apparently. Uh, okay. And then that seg faults. <coughs> so if I ran GDB on that, Uh, this is unfortunate. Um, so I don't have GDB installed on my Mac. That's just on the Linux machine. So I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, some examples next time for that. So um, that's the end of discussion. Unless anybody has any more questions. All right. So I hope everybody's working on the project. I'll see you guys next Monday.